What do you like about the Texas Heats? I know that you've mentioned those previously just today and then all other interviews when it comes to miking stuff. What do you like about the eminent speakers? Yeah, they're, they just have like this great bark to them, you know, real like responsive, like they don't compress too much. They're pretty, pretty neutral at a, in the frequency spectrum, I think, as far as like rock speakers go. You know, like if I try to use like greenbacks or something, I feel like there's this like spiky thing that happens at high gain that I don't like. Um, and then like 12Ls, there's like too much, um, you know, too much throw. They're like too dynamic. And this, I don't know, it just feels like the right balance of like, compression and um, aggression uh, and articulation for me. I'm also a really big fan of the um, of the uh, Celestian Classic Lead 80 and I had um, WGS recone some for me lately. I think that they used to make a Classic Lead 80 inspired speaker but they don't anymore. I could be mistaken about that. But they they still had like recone kits for originals, and their version of it sounds better than ever. Um, and I could have just as easily picked picked my cab loaded with those um, to do this to do this thing. So right right now in that little that little intro thing, I think I just had I just had a uh, AEA N22 turned on. Okay. Um, but I've got four mics on the cab, so I'm sorry I'm gonna have to turn my back to you for a sec. Um, but I've got uh, so I've got a first thing you'll hear is an AEA N22 which is a figure of a active ribbon mic. It's a really nice sounding mic. If I were to mic in the center of the speaker, I'd probably be happy with only that mic. Uh, but ribbons are, you know, they're known for picking up the, the deep stuff in a very um, responsive way. I've pushed that to the side of the cone in order to capture, to, to focus it mostly on the low end. So if that intro little like Aerosmith thing was dark, that's probably why. Um, then uh, closer to the middle of the speaker, uh, on the left, next to the N22, we've got a Heil PR30, which is also a great um, large diaphragm dynamic mic that's super responsive. Um, that's a lot brighter. It's a cardioid mic. Um, the next thing over, there's a there's a stack. So um, they're both sort of aimed at the edge of the edge of the dust cap. The the mic that's the top top right is um, a mic I've been messing with recently called um, it's made by Rode and it's a reporter mic. Um, and I think there's a lot of merit to using something like that because it's an omnidirectional dynamic. So with dynamic mics, we're, we're accustomed to them being cardioid microphones because they're often used on stages where there's monitors there and you need a cardioid pattern to reject feedback if, if it's a vocal mic or if it's um, on a drum set you know, and you're micing a floor tom with a dynamic mic or a snare drum, like you're trying to reject the cymbals that are adjacent to those drums. So having that cardioid pattern is really helpful in those situations. But for, but one of the benefits of, there's, one of the benefits of the NAMI microphone is that it has very little proximity effect. So, you know, as you turn the mic in different ways, talking into it or move it to or, you know, back and forth, the the uh, frequency response of the microphone doesn't change very much. And so that's why like newscasters will use a um, dynamic omnidirectional microphone because they can in be interviewing people at different distances away, people who don't have good mic technique. And it kind of doesn't, doesn't really matter. The mic is really forgiving for that. So the reason why I like it in a studio setting is, you know, I don't have to worry about, um, I don't have to worry about feedback from other microphones and or from excuse me from monitors and I also I have a good sounding room so I don't have to worry about ambient sound or bad ambient sound leaking into the back side or the sides of the microphone um, and I'm mostly using it to in the case of a vocal mic to make it forgiving to a singer's positioning but in the case of guitar I can close mic the guitar amp um, and get just a single speaker tone without worrying about any of the comb filtering that happens um, from like miking a, a cabinet from a distance and, and trying to get it perfectly in phase between all four, or in this case, all six speakers of a six by 12. Um, and, but it gives me a more, because it doesn't have the, the bass boost of a typical proximity effect, um, it doesn't give me that unrealistic bass boost that I might have to EQ out of 
a conventional guitar microphone. So that thing's really cool. We're going to hear that in a second. That's choice number three. And then choice number four is um, something I've been playing with recently. It's called an SE Microphones X1D. It's a discontinued mic, but um, they still make a version of it in their Titan microphone. And it's a large diaphragm uh, titanium sputtered condenser microphone. And so that has a really wide frequency response and also incredibly high SPL handling. Kurt, I know that you care so much about what you get for your tone in the studio and obviously it translates to on stage. Do you travel with a specific mic or request mics at venues when you do or because of your going maybe with the Line 6 you go direct? Yeah, lately it's it's I go direct with the Line 6. Previous to that I was using various um, analog cab sims like Palmer PDI-03 um, and I had a Rivera uh, Rock. rock? Rock Crusher? Rock re Rock Crusher. I forget which one. Rock, and it's not the, the Rock Crusher is the one with the, the graph EQ, I think. It's whatever the other, the, the slightly simpler version of it. Um, do I, I forget what it's called. Anyway, um, yeah, that stuff's cool and, and being consistent night to night. And also, I, I have, uh, I always play a stereo guitar rig, so having the phase relationship between the two amps be very consistent is really important to me. And um, so doing that without microphones, I feel, is crucial because when you have invariably have a bouncy stage and two mics and everything's kind of moving around all the time, the phase relationship between the two amps is ever changing. So to um, take that out of the equation, whether it's by using uh, amp sim, cab sim, or analog cab sim, I think is crucial. And I've been doing that for quite a long time. Um, and but also, when it comes to microphones, uh, I'm, I take an interest in it, but I'm also like, I have to distance myself a bit from it because I'm not a live sound engineer. I don't want to be a live sound engineer. And I also have some micromanaging tendencies, and I don't, but I don't want to be a person who micromanages. <laughs> um, so I trust our, um, our brilliant front of house engineer, Sean Johnson, um, to make good decisions and to make us sound good. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I don't travel with, with any of my own microphones other than, other than a vocal mic and that's just for sanitary reasons. Gotcha. All right. Well, at this point, let's dive into what's, uh, what's at your look, I'm assuming at your knees. Yeah. Well, no, well, let's hear each of these mics. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to turn on like a pedal just for some grit. <laughs> Um, so that's the the AA N22. Here's the uh, Heil PR30. All right, so that's that's the cardioid dynamic. Now let's check out that reporter mic, which is the Omni dynamic. And now the X1D, which is the SE, SE large diaphragm condenser. So that one's got a lot more top end sizzle and a lot more depth. Uh, turn them all on and just quickly try to find a good blend. I'm probably going to favor the dynamics just for uh, clarity. That'll, that'll work. <laughs> 